Hi everyone, my name is James. Welcome to King's Fine Woodworking. Today I'm going to show you how to build this outdoor patio table. It's a quick and easy build and just made with lumber from the big box store. But before we get started, I just wanted to remind everybody that our Father's Day sale has actually been extended due to request until the end of June. So you've got a few days left here, three or four days left, to pick up one of our um, exclusive Thor's Hammer woodworking mallets. They're engraved with our logo and they're made with exotic wood species from all over the world. There'll be a link in the description below if you're interested. You can check it out and we've got a discount code. It's Father's Day is the discount code and the mallets are on sale actually for half price. So it's half of our normal price for the sale until the end of the month. All right, so back to our project. What we used here was Douglas fir that we got from our local big box store, but you could use pressure treated or even southern yellow pine. And what we're getting started with is cutting out the feet, the bottom units for the legs. One of the cool things about this project is you can build it with very few tools. You can actually just have a circular saw and a drill and do the whole project no problem. You don't need a chop saw. In fact, I'll do some cutting later with circular saw and show you it's really just as fast. So for the feet, I wanted to be a little bit decorative. Uh, they're pretty big since they're two by eight, so I wanted to cut the corners off of each side and just give it kind of a nice looking profile. So I'm gonna flip this over and cut the same thing off of the other side here. I didn't really have to put a pencil mark everywhere. I just put one the very first time to kind of help me get it lined up with my saw. And I've got a little stop there on the left-hand side to show me where to, uh, where to slide my board over to. And that's it. This is pretty straightforward uh, to cut these. And I'm going to actually do a little notch out in the bottom. So I've got a circular saw here for this. And I'm kind of plunging in with the blade. And you'll, you'll see what the notch looks like when it's done here. Uh, the, I'm going to cut the straight part of it with the circular saw so I get a nice straight even cut. And then I'll come back and I'll finish this notch out with the jigsaw. This kind of takes my big foot that's going to be on either side of the table and turns it into two separate little foot pads so that it sort of has four feet when it's all done. I think it makes it look a little bit better. And this is a, a bigger board here. It's a 2 by 12 I'm going to make this as the leg. We're just going to have one leg on other, either side. Uh, so it's sort of like a trestle table. And I want the two to be exact so I've got a little stop set up there on my uh, miter station. Now I'm doing something a little weird. The feet on each side consist of three of these boards put together. And the very middle board, I'm going to cut a section out of it. And that's what I'm doing here. The reason I'm doing that is because I want the leg to slide down into this big three-piece uh, foot. And you'll kind of see how that looks in just a minute. It'll all make sense. But I basically traced out the width of a 2 by 12 on the middle of the one of the three pieces that make up the foot. And you'll see how I put them all back together again here in just a second. I'm really creating a giant mortise and tenon joint. And by me pulling out this middle piece, that's the, the mortise that I'm actually making. So these boards are a little bit narrower. And these are going to make up the cleat that goes on top that basically attach to the leg and attach to the table. So they're directly above the feet components that I was making a moment ago. And I don't need these to be quite as thick or beefy. So they're just made of something that's a little bit thinner. Uh, this is a two by six here as opposed to the two by eight that I have down below. But it's basically the same procedure. Uh, I've got to cut six of them because it takes three to make up uh, each component. And once I'm done with that, of course, I'm going to go back and chop the angles off on these two because I want it to look the symmetrical, the same up at the top as it does uh, down below. And like I was saying a little bit ago, you certainly don't need a chop saw. This can just be cut with a circular saw 
And you see it might even be faster with a circular saw. Once you draw the lines out, you just, you know, follow those with your circular saw and cut them out. There's no uh, no big advantage to having a chop saw here. I think I just kind of get addicted to it because it's sitting here in my shop. But this is a fantastic project for somebody who do doesn't have a lot of tools. If you have a fairly limited shop, because so like I said, just a circular saw and a drill, and that's it. You can build this whole table. And it's a lot fancier than, say, your standard picnic table. I think it's uh, a pretty nice uh, trestle design that we came up with, and it looks really good. All right, so these top cleats that are going to go on the leg have the same deal here. I've got to cut out the center of the center section in order to create the mortise up top for when this whole assembly goes together. And it's going to make sense in just a minute when I assemble a leg. All right, once those are all cut, I'm gonna leave those center sections behind and take the, the two ends with me over to my assembly table. And I'm gonna put the leg in place, which I've marked a center line on, and I've marked a center line on my foot. And then I'm gonna put the middle part of the three components that make up the feet together here. And you notice that center section we cut out is missing, and that's how it fits together and creates the pocket or the mortise. And then we're gonna glue this together. I'm gonna to use Type Bond 3, which is rated for outdoors, and when that's all set up, we'll screw it together. I'd like to take a moment to ask a favor of everybody out there. Uh, on our stats, it shows that only about 15% of the people who watch our videos are, are actually subscribers. And you know, I've never really pushed for it or asked for people to subscribe in most of the first videos. I never did. Uh, but if you guys like our videos, and I would really, and you don't mind, I would really appreciate if you would click that subscribe button down below. By doing that, that's really the main way that our channel grows. And you know, if you're watching the videos anyway, and you click that, you know, and you click the bell, you'd get notified of new things that come out. And that really does help our channel grow. So I would appreciate that if that's something you could do for us. Thank you. Okay, here I'm using a countersink bit to just set up and put a couple of holes in there. And I'm going to use a two and a half inch deck screw. Uh, these are Deckmate ceramic coated screws. They're fantastic. But I'm going to use a two and a half inch screw because I'm just screwing through two pieces of lumber that are inch and a half thick each. So I can't really put a three inch screw because the tip might uh, poke through on the other side. So we're going to put this together and then we've got the combination of the glue and the screws. I think this joint is going to last a long time. And I'm going to do the same thing exactly to the other side here. And I want to point out all of the knots and the defects in this wood. And I did something on purpose. I did not attempt to select only pretty wood from the big box door. I'm going to show you how nice this table looks when it's all done. Even though I just took wood with defects, knots, and knot holes, I don't think those detract from it because overall the table looks good enough. So this is something you don't necessarily have to spend a lot of time on, you know, pre-selecting your wood to get it absolutely perfect. You could, but it's just not that important. Okay, with two of the three layers of the foot done, we're now ready to put the top, the third and final layer of the foot. And you can see how that's going to close that in and create the mortise for us. So I'm gonna do the same thing here. I wanna put glue on both sides and we're gonna do glue and screws together to hold this together. Now I'm just going to kind of start by lining up one side. I'll pre-drill and I'll put screws in it. And these screws can actually be three inch screws if I want. They don't have to be two and a halfs because now I'm going through three pieces of lumber. And typically when I do work with dimensional lumber, I'll use a bigger screw if I can. But by bigger, I do stop at three inches. I just keep a stack of uh, two and a halfs and, and threes in stock, as well as inch and five eighths for some smaller stuff. But those are my three primary sizes. And you can see there, it's the three inches that I'm using in this case. And I'm getting low, so I'm gonna have to get back there and get some more here.
And for joints like this, it's a pretty uh, critical joint that's got to bear a lot of weight uh, in case somebody wants to sit on the edge of the table. So usually I'll use four screws or sometimes even five screws per joint depending on uh, what the joint is. And that concludes the building of that leg unit. So that's, hopefully that makes good sense now. We've got the center section open and that sort of acts like a mortise where the leg will fit right down into that pocket. When that's done, I'll just clamp this in my vise, or you could just have somebody hold it for you. And uh, I like to go over the edges with a belt sander and smooth them all up, even them all up in case they're not perfectly even. Sometimes when you buy lumber from these stores, some pieces are a little bit thicker, some pieces are a little bit thinner. They're not always perfect, so we can dress them up this way. And then also, if we cut it on the chop saw, we might have put some burns in it. So just take a moment with the belt sander and take all of those burns off. I usually put a 36 grit on and that's very aggressive and works really quick. Gets rid of the burns, looks nice. So one thing that we're going to do that really sets this apart from your average picnic table or even a regular outdoor patio table is we're going to put a router profile on all the edges. We'll put a chamfer bit uh, which is cuts off a 45 degree bevel and I'm going to do a really big one because this is a big beefy leg. And so I have a bigger than normal chamfer bit, but you can just use a regular chamfer bit that you buy and just, you know, bury the bit uh, all the way down so it cuts off uh, a big a big angler, big bevel. Do a test piece, see what you think looks good. And uh, I think uh, you'll see what, what we've done here. And it just really dresses it up, makes the table look a lot more elegant, um, makes a big difference. Okay, so I guess we'll go ahead and test fit the mortise. And there she is, still photobombing to this day. So, yep, the mortise fits in nice and tight. And this is the top uh, piece that I put together, not the bottom that you just saw me do. That's the top because there's no notch in it. But I put it in until it buried, and I made a mark of how deep that goes in. I'm going to make the same mark with the bottom. This is the foot portion. And I don't necessarily have to put it in there, but I'll just put it up against the side. I'll make a mark. I want to know where, uh, what wood of the leg is going to be exposed because I'm going to put a chamfer on that too. But I don't want the chamfer to go all the way down inside of the mortise because it might look weird where the leg goes into the mortise. So I'll just chamfer between those two points. I think that'll look a little bit better. Ah, and if you happen to be interested and you want to build a table just like this one, I will have a set of detailed 3D plans available. I'll put a link in the description below and it'll give you a complete materials list, tell you exactly what you need to buy and exactly what sizes to cut everything and how to put it together. All right, so that's done and I have inserted the leg into the foot piece. So for this one, it's pretty critical because the you see the leg is actually three quarters of an inch off the ground because of my notch. So I'm going to put five screws in here. I want maximum holding strength and I don't want this to wiggle. I want it to be real secure because this has got to carry that whole tabletop and I know someone's going to sit on the edge of the table or something like that. So I've kind of spaced out equally five screws around the perimeter here and I'm sure that'll hold and I'm going to flip it over and I'm going to put five screws on the other side as well. And for those of you who don't recognize the girl in the pink hair, that is my next youngest daughter. Her name is Kavita, and we call her Covey. And she has decided to come and work in the shop full time. She got very jealous of her sisters here all the time working. And so, so she's here now, so you'll probably see her a lot too. Uh, you're probably familiar with Maya, who's always there. And then my youngest daughter, Sai. We actually have five girls, and who you'll see from time to time. But Covey has decided she wants to come and start putting in a lot of time. So that's pretty cool. All right, so that mortise fit nice and tight. That worked out really well. Now, one thing I want to do is quickly measure from the ground. Uh, my assembly table is flat, so it acts like the ground. Measure from the ground to the top on both sides. It's got to be identical. I want to make sure I didn't put this top piece on and it'd be slightly lower on one side than the other, which might give me a twist in my tabletop or cause my tabletop to lean one way or the other. So I just wanted to measure both of those before I put this together. And then once that's done, same deal. We'll put five screws on each side here. And when that's done, we'll have a complete leg unit. Now I'll do the next leg unit here. And we got another really tight fit, which is great. If it's sloppy, then I got to rely on just the screws. But if I get some tightness in there, that friction is going to help out a little bit too.
And this was just a little check that I did on both sides to make sure that the leg itself was square to the ground or square to the top of the foot, which is of course parallel to the ground, before I proceeded to screw those together. And then we just put the rest of this one together and that's it for the two legs. So when the legs are done, I'm gonna set those aside and then I'm gonna lay out all of the boards for the top of the table on my assembly table. I put them upside down, so the pretty side is down, and I put a 1 8 inch spacer between each of them. Now these are all exotic wood spacers, but any spacer of course will work, even some paint sticks, whatever you got, get spacers between them. And if I clamp them down, it'll hold them snug, and then I can tap out the warps. Because, you know, these boards are never perfectly flat. They've all got a little warp. But if you keep the clamp tight, you can generally tap the warps out in order to proceed working here. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut some cleats out of some 2x6 material to screw on the bottom of the tabletop just to kind of help hold it all flat. And I don't really want those cleats having big square corners sticking out for, you know, when our legs are under the table or reaching under the table. So I think if we put a big chamfer on the edge of these things, kind of knock the corners off, that's going to end up looking a lot better underneath there too. And we can't forget routering. It's important to router as much as we can with our chamfer bit in order to maintain that look and that consistency throughout the build. That's what's going to set this table apart and give it a really good look. And here I've marked specific distances from the center so that we have these laid out nice and symmetrically. I happen to have a big uh, drywall square that I can use to lay across here so we can draw the whole thing in one go. But if you don't have that, it's okay. Just make a measurement mark on each side and use a framing square. Or just measure on both sides and use a straight edge like a straight board. That works too. And that just kind of gives us a reference as to where we want to line up this cleat. This cleat is going to basically hold our tabletop nice and flat everywhere. We want to take measurements on both sides because we want the, the cleat equally uh, spaced from the edge on both sides because that symmetry looks better. And then if you can just trick somebody into standing on it and holding it still while you pre-drill some holes and put some screws, you're going to be good to go. And truthfully, that's one of the best ways to get your younger kids out into the shop to help you. They love to stand on things and hold them still while you, you put things together. Uh, they feel like they've really helped out a lot, and it really does help you out a lot. And then to keep them in the shop, all you have to do is build them something cool. Find out something they really like, tell them they can make it, and help them make it. You know, Make them a sword, make them a box, something that they can get involved with and get their hands on it too. And they just love that stuff. And, you know, once they try woodworking, they're hooked. That's, that's my experience anyway. Anybody who gives it a shot just can't resist. My girls have always loved it. Even when they got older and they moved out, they'd always call up and say, hey, you building anything? You know, they want to come by. They want to help. They want to be part of the shop. It's, it's just so much fun. And, and I can tell you from experience, it's a million times more fun if your family helps you out. All right, so once those cleats are in, we're going to jump to the legs. So I've jumped ahead just a little bit here, and I have assembled the legs as if they're in their normal upright position. We're going to ignore the tabletop below it for just a minute, and these legs are in their normal position. I have a little tiny spacer block beneath this rail that's going across the two legs. The trestle there is what we're going to call it. And we're going to just take accurate measurements and we're going to put that together. That trestle is going to hold those two legs together. We're going to use some long clamps to put these together. And you could use a toe strap if you don't have clamps. Or you could just have someone help you hold it while you screw one side in at a time. So we've taken careful measurements to make sure that that's in the center. And we've checked with our square to make sure that that trestle, that rail, is going straight up and down in the middle. 
So it's spaced off the bottom and it's going straight up and down and it's right in the middle. And we're just gonna check square on this side as well. We've gotta move that around the spacer block to check. And we've got that, that's nice and square. And now we'll go ahead and go to the outside and we're gonna mark the center because that trestle is on the very center of the inside. We took careful measurements. So we're taking careful measurements to mark this on the outside as well. We marked it like in a low, middle, and a high spot. And we use a square. We'll draw a line there. And that's the dead center. So that's the line we want our screws going down. And then we're going to take a couple of other measurements, marks, for where we want to put the screws. And I'm not just going to put standard screws in this. We're going to go with something a little bit bigger. It's a GRK screw. It's like a 5 16 by 5 inch screw. Very aggressive screw. It's one of the ones that they can use to replace a ledger with. It's, it has more strength than a lag screw, but it's quite a bit smaller. Uh, the key before you put them in, of course, is to pre-drill. And you got to use the right size pre-drill bit for those. And then all of the threads from the uh, screw will actually go in and bite and it'll be a really strong joint. And the rail that goes across in the middle is just a 2 by 10 and I've put the same chamfer on that that I've put on everything else. So there wasn't anything tricky about it, it's just knowing the measurement is all you need. And there's that screw, you can see it there. It's a GRK, great big screw, very aggressive, has a lot of bite and so three of these together are really strong. Now I wouldn't attempt to use a regular deck screw here. You want something that's going to penetrate deep and get a good bite for a long way because we're drilling and screwing into end grain. The trestle, the rail that's in the middle of this trestle table is end grain so it's not terribly strong. It's not a strong joint. But if we get a real long screw it is. So it's worth that extra dollar um, to go ahead and buy those screws. I think they're about a buck or a buck ten a screw. So it's worth it to buy six of those to put this thing together with. I think the whole project's like about 75 bucks, so it's not an outrageous project. All right, so now we're going to turn around. Remember, we built it right side up. So I've got to turn it upside down in order to mount it on the tabletop because the tabletop is upside down as well. So hopefully that makes sense there. And at this point, it's critical to just take nice, accurate measurements. We want to make sure that it's equidistant from each end of the table and equidistant from each side of the table. For us, it's easy because I just have one person at each corner. Uh, but you'll have to walk around the table a couple times if it's just you in the shop taking those measurements. But once you get that all set, then we got to make some cleats to hold the leg unit to the tabletop. Now I'm using a table saw here, but of course you could just use a circular saw. All you're doing is ripping four two by twos to do this, or you could just buy two by twos. You don't have to rip them. I just had this board left over extra, so I'm ripping them. Once I have them ripped, I'll take them over to my chop saw and I'm gonna cut them to the required length. Once again, if this is something that you think you want plans for, uh, just check in the description below the video and I'll have a link for you to get the plans. It'll include every piece that's needed, all the dimensions you have to cut everything at, and exactly how it goes together. Once those are sized, we're going to need to run a series of holes down two sides because this board, this is a cleat, it's going to have to screw into the leg unit and into the table. So we're going to have to have screw holes on two sides. I like to have my screws about every four or five inches apart. And probably not any closer than two inches from an edge because we don't want these boards splitting either. I need to give a shout out to our community group on Facebook. It's called King's Fine Woodworking Community. I'll put a link to that in the description in case you're interested, but we've got thousands of members. It's a closed group, a woodworking only group. <clears throat> you have to uh, uh, sign up to get into it. We don't just let anybody in. And if you're a woodworker though, it's no problem. You can get in. And it's a place to share your work. It's a place to post pictures, to ask questions if you need help. There's woodworkers of all levels in there. There are beginners, uh, there are master woodworkers, and everybody in between, and everybody really helps out answering questions. I also write articles for the group, and we can get advance uh, notice on sales and things like that. I post that to the group as well. So it's a cool place. It's on Facebook if you happen to be on Facebook, but I'll put a description in the video below. 
And here I have got to cut the corners off of this for the same reason we did for the cleats. We don't want a, a sharp edge poking out underneath the tabletop. And there they are in place. You can kind of get a feel for what they're going to do. So now all we have to do is screw those cleats in place. Uh, first thing we'll do is just screw it down to the table on both sides all the way and then we'll screw it into the leg unit itself. Uh, this, the nice feature here is that in the future if I ever have to disassemble this table maybe to put it into storage or disassemble it to move I can just simply unscrew the screws that hold the cleat to the leg itself. The legs will come out. I can pull the leg units apart and this table will store and pack flat. I can do that for moving or for storage. This is another thing that kids love doing. They can do assembly, and it's pretty safe for a kid to operate an impact driver and put screws in. So I've actually become quite talented at this. She's helped us build decks. She's probably driven 10,000 screws in putting our workshop together. So she actually does this at a pretty high rate of speed. And we don't need those spacers in anymore because the table's all screwed down. I'm going to show you this tool. Sometimes you get those holes in there kind of going the wrong way and you can't really get your drill in there to fit. So you need a right angle tool. This thing really makes things easy. Uh, Cy makes the tool look easy. It takes a few minutes actually probably to get used to it. But you just put the screw on it and you can get into some really tight corners. And you just hold that, put the right amount of pressure, and it just drives right in. Okay, the table is nearing completion. I'm gonna go ahead and cut the ends off. I bought eight foot boards, which is what I always do. They usually have checks and splits at the end. These weren't too bad, so I always cut some off. If your boards are perfect, you can certainly leave your table at eight feet, but I think I'm gonna cut about three or four inches off each side and have a table that's maybe seven and a half feet or somewhere in that range. Size mark on the other side for me. And then after I've drawn my line with a straight edge, we'll just go through with a circular saw and cut it off flush all at once. Now, of course, this square look on the end doesn't really fit with the chamfer theme that we have going on everywhere else. So I'm just going to take a little quick measurement and I'm going to cut the corners off. This is really going to add a nice touch of class to the table. We'll do this at all four corners and I think you'll like the look. I want to take one more quick moment to say thank you, thank you, thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. You guys are the best. In fact, it was you guys who gave us the idea to build this table. Uh, one of you wanted to see it, and that's why we have it here. Um, if anybody's interested in helping support us on Patreon, I have a link to that below. And uh, without you guys, there's a lot of stuff we, we just couldn't do on our channel. And we love doing this, so thank you. So we just got four more screws left in the top part of the leg unit on each side. And then it's time to take it off of the assembly table and set it up. If you don't have an assembly table, you can just build it on your garage floor or a patio floor or even on top of a table saw or someplace like that. So there it is. That's the basic outline of the table. I think the corner cutoffs really make it look nice, but of course, we still got to put our chamfer along the top of the table itself. I like to do the end grain first because the end grain is likely to chip out. So if I do the straight grain first and then I get an end grain chip out, the chip out may go too deep. So if I hit the end grain portions first and I get a chip out, usually the chip out will disappear when I do the straight grain. So after that, we're going to sand this all the way around. And then we'll take a few minutes and we'll try to sand the, the whole table, top and bottom, down to about 150 grit. I'm not going to put in too much effort. We're going to give it an oil finish. Actually, it's going to be a Danish oil, which is a hardening oil because it's got some polyurethane in it. And what we decided to do is to mix. We're using Watco Danish oil, and we mixed it 50-50 with cherry Watco Danish oil and clear natural Watco Danish oil. So it gave us a little bit lighter pink look. Looks a little bit reddish here, but when it's all done, it'll be just very lightly pink. And we put three coats of this on. 
and then we actually ran a, a thin coat of epoxy on the bottom of the feet on each of the four feet to make it watertight and there it is the project is all complete and I hope you liked it thanks for watching